Good morning. Welcome to Saturday. You made it to an 8.30 session on Saturday morning, so you should give yourself some applause. That's a big deal. Um, so I am Missy Bryan. I um, teach in the occupational therapy program at Belmont University, and my clinical work is at the Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt. And so this is our seating and mobility team um, from the Children's Hospital, um, and we um, are excited to talk with you today. So we're, I know a six panel presentation is a lot of presenters. I'll go through and introduce our team. Um, so we have Meredith Russo, who actually is not at Vanderbilt anymore. She's moved out of state, but has been a part of our team. So um, has helped us create this. Um, she's a physical therapist. We have Stephanie Fraser, who is an occupational therapist, Chrissy Madison, physical therapist, Ken Swantek, physical therapist, and Sarah Moran, physical therapist. So we're excited to talk to you today about a topic that um, we have had lots of questions about what do we do? What do we do about kids who are eloping? Um, and so we are coming to you with the lens, not that we have all the solutions for what to do, but we hope to present some considerations for how can we help these kids and families well. Um, so uh, just know we're not presenting a uh, decision tree that's like, here's your exact method of how to um, find a solution for every child and family. Um, but hopefully we give you a lens with which to consider. Um, we don't have any financial interest with any manufacturers, products, entities. Um, we will have products in our presentation. They are just examples of types of equipment. They are not, it's not an all-inclusive list of equipment. So let's start out by talking about elopement. So what is elopement? Um, it's when someone who is dependent on caregivers exposes themselves to potential danger by leaving supervision, leaving a safe space, or leaving the care of a responsible person. So for a lot of the children that we are working with, this looks like children who are running out the front door of their home when it is open, or climbing over a fence or gate to get out of the yard, or getting out of their car seat um, in the car, or trying to get out of a vehicle, um, running out of a school building. So um, you can imagine this presents lots of safety uh, safety hazards. Um, elopement is is a common um, is common among children uh, among autistic children. So about a third to a half of autistic children um, uh, experience elopement at some point during their childhood, um, and then also, but it's not just, um, it doesn't just occur in children, in autistic children. Um, about a quarter of individuals with intellectual disability also elope, and it can happen among other um, conditions as well. So as we consider elopement patterns, elopement can occur in all settings. So it can occur at home, it can occur from um, from the school, it can occur in the community, at the grocery store, at the library, at a park, playground, church. Um, every child, hopefully we can identify some patterns um, in their elopement. And that's a really important thing to help families kind of talk through and figure out is what is your child's elopement pattern? Are they more likely to elope in a familiar space or an unfamiliar space? Are they more likely um, to elope to get away from something they don't like, to get to something they do like, or do they just generally have a wandering behavior? Um, so um, establishing and learning about those patterns um, is an important way for us to figure out how do we help uh, children and families with this. So as we consider the impact of elopement, um, there, uh, how many of you work with individuals who, uh, who elope? And it's scary, right? Like it's a big deal. It's a big, scary deal. Um, so there are far reaching impacts, um, the most severe of which would be injury or death. So um, a third of elopement among autistic individuals that was reported to police or media um, in this uh, study that they did um, were fatal or required immediate medical attention. That's a scary thought, right? So, and of course, these are the, this is elopement that rose to the occasion that we couldn't find the person. We actually had to alert media. We had to call police. We had to call news. Um, but that's a very scary statistic. And so we want to make sure that we're doing all we can to keep children, um, children safe. 
we also know that caregivers are really, really overwhelmed. Um, I know that I see a child for 60 or 90 minutes in a therapy session and the parent is there. And a lot of times there's another team member who is there. And when that child leaves my session, I'm tired. We've been working really hard for 60 or 90 minutes to keep that child safe. But that parent is going to go home and they're doing that 24 hours a day forever. And so um, caregivers definitely feel overwhelmed. They don't get a lot of rest. They have to be constantly vigilant. They have to be constantly aware of where their child is, what they're doing. Are they safe? Um, and also they get very little education from healthcare providers on elopement and what to do about it. Um, and so that's kind of what we're hoping to do is do a better job with that of how do we support um, support caregivers in problem solving um, this challenge. And then um, uh, Teresa Plummer and I and um, some occupational therapy uh, doctoral students did a study and we looked at, we did a caregiver survey and looked at caregiver participation among um, caregivers who have children who elope and found that caregivers leave their home less frequently if they have a child who elope and also limit the distance that they travel. So these families in an effort to keep their child safe are staying home more, they're not going places, which reduces participation, which creates social isolation. Um, and so it makes them even less likely to get some of the supports that they, that they might need. Um, and then a research study that I'm doing with some OTD students right now that's in process. Um, we also are um, surveying caregivers um, and um, caregivers report limitations in social participation, in sleep, work, play, and health management. So it's really across the board um, where caregivers are experiencing limitations because they are trying to help a child who elopes stay safe. So I'm going to kick it over to Meredith, who's going to talk to you about some factors to consider as we make decisions related to this. Thank you, Missy. Um, so my name is Meredith Russo, um, and now I will be talking through with you guys um, some factors we want to consider as we as a team are making decisions for strategies for elopement reduction. Um, so as we're making these decisions, we want to be focused on that specific child and that family to determine what will work best for them. Um, so a really important question we need to ask is who are the caregivers? So many times we think this is the parents, um, but need to consider, you know, in some family situations, it could be grandparents, it could be only one parent, it could be multiple caregivers, it could be a child who's in foster care, it could be a child who transitions between different caregivers' homes, um, and, you know, fluctuating work schedules, then it changes, you know, week by week. So there's many, many times it's not just, you know, who you think of traditionally as the caregiver. Um, and then you want to ask whoever that caregiver or those caregivers are, you want to ask them, you know, their specific concerns. Are there certain places? Are there certain times of day that the elopement seems to happen more frequently? Um, or is it, you know, in the child's routine versus out of the routine? Um, you know, is it a kid who, who does it consistently with elopement? Or is it, you know, if there's a change in routine, we're more likely to see it? Or does it happen, you know, happen in both situations? Um, and so as Missy, you know, started to talk about, we often, you know, don't think about where these families are not going to due to elopement concerns. You know, it's easy to list like, oh, they elope when we go here, here, and here, but we don't always think about um, where the families are not going because of the elopement concerns. So I think I want to highlight our last two questions there at the bottom. Does the family limit travel due to elopement concerns, or does the family limit social situations due to elopement concerns? Um, and these are actually very big problems. Um, so I want to read a quote to you from um, a 2012 study by Anderson et al. Um, it said, they said, among parents of elopers, 43% reported the issue had prevented family members from getting a good night's sleep. 62% reported that elopement concerns had prevented their family from attending or enjoying activities outside the home. For 56%, Elopement was one of the most stressful behaviors they had to cope with as caregivers of a child with autism spectrum disorder, and 50% reported receiving no guidance from anyone on preventing or addressing their child's elopement behavior. So now moving on to the family's home environment. Um, so I think an important question to ask here is how much supervision is the child needing in their home? Um, for many of these children, they're needing constant supervision. 
Um, so that would mean the caregiver has limited times for preparing meals, taking care of other children, self-care, um, and that can contribute to high levels of caregiver burnout. So looking at sleep specifically, um, many times these children are not sleeping for a full night. Um, so therefore the caregivers are not sleeping or not sleeping well due to safety concerns. Um, so sometimes if there's two caregivers, you know, they, they may alternate who's sleeping. So somebody's always up with the child. Um, you can imagine if there's only one caregiver, that would make it a lot more challenging. Um, there are families who will report the child sleeps in the bed with them so that they can feel when they start to get up. Um, sometimes they move the bed to the floor um, or they, you know, are blocking doors, things like that, um, all in attempts to, to try to keep the child safe at night. Um, so I think, again, here it's important to ask the family specifically what safety concerns they are having with their child in their home environment. Um, so, you know, all of these questions, is the child able to open doors, whether that's internal doors like out of their bedroom or exterior door like exiting the house? Um, you know, are they opening cabinets or drawers? Are they finding things like a knife in the kitchen that they shouldn't be? Are they able to climb? Are they, um, you know, being destructive or, or aggressive? Um, and it obviously depends on the child, but many times caregivers will report multiple of these safety concerns. So next thinking about when the family goes out into the community. Um, so will they stay, will this child stay with the caregiver um, out in the community? So for some children, for example, it may be as simple as holding their hand, um, or there are some, you know, if they have those backpacks with like the harness or the leash, um, for some children that may work, but for some, it may actually do the opposite. They may resist that more because of feeling that constraint, and then it could actually increase their chances, increase their chances for elopement. Um, so I think something really important is to try to determine the reason for elopement, um, because the approach we choose may be different depending on the reason that the child is eloping. Um, however, this is very tricky because many times we are not sure why they are eloping, or it may be for different reasons in different settings. Um, so the quote up here um, was from that same Anderson et al. study, um, and they reported the most frequently reported motivations were simply enjoys running or exploring, trying to reach a place he or she enjoys, trying to escape an anxious situation, trying to escape uncomfortable sensory stimuli, or pursues his or her special topic. So again, thinking a little more about the community, um, depending where you are in the country, what is in that community can look very different. So we wanna think about the dangers in the community as well as the supports that might be available to the child and their family. Um, so, you know, thinking about the, the community itself and the, the different dangers, um, a city environment, you might be worried more about traffic, noise, cars, a lot of strangers and unfamiliar people to the child. Um, versus a rural environment, you might be more worried about going out, getting lost in the woods, or that there's, you know, creeks or lakes or bodies of water nearby. Um, but speaking of the water, you know, we, we might initially think like, oh, a lake or a creek, um, a more rural environment, but even like if the family or someone in the neighborhood has a pool, that could even be in like a city or suburban um, environment as well. Um, so there's several statistics listed on that picture. Um, one I really want to highlight is the last one. Um, which says 71% of deaths related to wandering are caused by drowning. And to me, that's really scary. Um, so I think, you know, especially thinking about a pool, a lake, whatever body of water might be available to that child if they did elope, um, you know, one support we could think about, ideally we would find strategies to decrease the risk of elopement, but just for like as a backup for safety, if um, they were in that situation of eloping to the body of water, thinking about if they were enrolled in swim lessons prior, you know, you might feel a little more comfortable. Um, and then other supports to think about if possible, you know, getting to know your neighbors um, and introducing your child and yourself and saying, you know, here's, here's my phone number or here's what I want you to do if, if you happen to find my child out, out wandering. Um, kind of the same idea with first responders, you know, police and fire introducing the child. Um, and it may not be possible for every child, but teaching them if you know you are out by yourself, here's who I want you to find. Um, but again, that might be tricky. They might not understand that concept or they might not be, not be able to communicate it if they were to find that person. Um, some other strategies in, in our research that we were seeing with, or in our um, looking at different research, um, they talked about designating meeting places um, or wearing bright colors so that the child would be 
easier to spot if they were in that could be you know out running in the street or out in the woods a brighter color might be easier to see um, and then one other idea that I thought was really cool that came up was they talked about a daily picture um, so again thinking about these caregivers that already have a lot on their plate they're already burned out but it's it's one more thing to add each day um, but with the hopes that they don't they don't need it but then if they did happen to be in that situation that the child elopes that day it would be helpful for that really high stress situation they at least have a picture to say I know exactly what they were wearing here's what I want you to give out to you know police or out in the community um so next moving on to transportation so when we talk about elopement in terms of transportation um thinking about in a car we're referring to a child like unbuckling out of their car seat harness or out of their booster seat um and so again you know kind of considering in the family's routine where is it happening when is it happening how often um it may or may not make a difference but you know for some kids it might be better where certain times of day or always when they're going to this specific place. Um, some kids, it may be every single time they're in the car. Um, and so something to think about if they are unbuckling themselves, you know, if there is a sibling in the back seat with them, or if there's a caregiver who is able to sit in the back seat, does that change it? Again, some it may, some it may not. Um, but will they respond if a caregiver tells them, oh, put your seatbelt back on um, or a timer, you know, in five more minutes, you can take it off. Um, some children that may work, some it may not. Um, so we, you know, we could think about the timer, we could think about a toy to distract them, for example, like a toy when, um, you know, you only get this in the car, and that's, you know, your transition time. Um, or if it's a longer trip, you know, taking breaks more frequently, again, depending on the child, some of these may work, some of them may not. Um, but I think it's also really important to take into account what does the child do after they unbuckle themselves. So many times these children will be unbuckled and then moving about in the car they may try to unbuckle their sibling um they may you know trying to be climbing to the front seat which is distracting the driver they may be starting to get aggressive either with the driver or another sibling in the car um or they're trying to open the doors or the windows and you know ideally in the back seat there's child locks on the doors and the windows however if they're climbing to the front seat which may not have those child locks then um you know that's a whole nother safety concern so thinking about them, you know, opening the door, getting out, or just, you know, the driver is at higher risk for an accident because they're distracted or they're trying to, you know, calm them from being aggressive with somebody until they can get pulled over to, to go deal with the situation. Um, and so majority of the time when we're looking at this, we are um, considering the family's own vehicle. But again, thinking about, you know, depending on the, the caregivers and their situation, what if the caregiver doesn't drive or if they um, transition between multiple caregivers vehicles um, or you know even more challenging if they take public transportation or they're taking ubers to get to medical appointments things like that so if you know thinking about the family has to install and uninstall then reinstall the car seat every time they get in an uber it's it's not a consistent routine for the child that's going to make it harder so you know the toy or the timer or something like that might be less effective if every time they're meeting unfamiliar people they're in an unfamiliar setting they don't really know what to expect um and then lastly um and definitely not least we want to look about think about the child specifically um so it's already come up a few times with the other factors we were talking about, but we want to make it individualized to the child um, and consider their autonomy. So does that child understand if they're told no or stop? Some children, they may understand, some they may not. And outside of the understanding, but will they respond appropriately if they're told no or stop? Um, does the child understand why they're being restrained? So like why they're in the harnessing in the car seat, why they have the stroller belt, why they're told to hold their hand out, out in public? Again, some children may understand this, some may not. Um, some of these children may also be tactile defensive, so they might not like a certain texture, like the harnessing of the seatbelt might just feel really uncomfortable to them. Um, or they might just not like touch in general. So like holding their hand might not be a good strategy because they don't like that. Um, and I think another really important one to highlight is, is the child able to communicate what they want? So obviously not a generalization, we need to look at each child specifically, but many of these children who elope have some sort of communication challenges. So they may be nonverbal, or they may have limited words, or they may use a communication device, um, or they may just need extra processing time. So it could be easily overwhelming um, if they're in a new or a changing environment. Um, and so all of these factors can make it 
more challenging for them to understand what is happening, and then therefore they're more likely to try to escape. Um, so as we've talked about, there's a lot of different factors for a child, their family unit, their home environment, their community, and their transportation um, that we need to keep in mind as we're trying to determine what will work best for that specific child and their caregivers. So now I will hand it off to Stephanie, who is going to discuss some options for equipment that we might consider for these patients. Hello, I'm Stephanie, and as Meredith said, I'm going to be going over some equipment options today that we use um, to, to handle elopement. Um, so our ultimate goal in our clinic is that we want to use the least restrictive equipment as possible. So I'm going to give kind of different ranges of the equipment, starting off with very least um, costly, going all the way up to most costly, most expensive. Um, this is to be used, you know, when other options have failed um, and a child's safety is still at risk. So let's see. So the first thing I'm going to start off with is this awesome free resource that's available through the National Autism Association. It's called the Big Red Safety Box. It has a lot of stuff in it and you can get, I believe, one per household completely free. It has a big red safety booklet, and this has resources on how to prevent the elopement and creating an emergency response plan for the family, two wireless alarms for the doors and windows to use in the home, an ID bracelet or a shoe ID tag so that if the child did wander off, we have a tag on them so that when hopefully someone finds them, they can alert the family that, hey, I've got your kid that you're looking for. Um, stop signs to be used as visual prompts. These are put on the doors um, of the child's home. And a safety alert cling for the, for the window in a car. Um, and then a child ID kit from the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. So a pretty awesome resource. Okay, and next I'm going to talk about non-DME options. So um, these are things you can, they're lower cost. You can purchase them at Amazon, Walmart, Target, places like that. They're very accessible for families. Um, the purpose of these uh, kind of have two categories for them. One would be to limit the child's movement to help their safety. That would be things like the little anti-loss wrist length that that cute little girl has on, a harness for the child to wear, or a backpack that has a leash on it just to limit their ability to sprint off. Uh, then we have things that are going to help um, maintain them in their environment. So that would be things like the locks and the alarms on the windows and doors and things like that. Okay. And the, <laughs> the next slide here is uh, higher cost non-DME options. Again, these are available um, at places like Walmart and Target and Amazon, things like that. Um, but they are, you know, probably going to be around $100 or more. This would be putting security cameras in your home using nanny cameras, GPS tracking devices. Um, the, the picture of the shoe is called the, um, the smart sole, and it's pretty cool. It can go in the shoe, and it has GPS tracking that can sync to your phone, so you can locate where your child's at if they would were to wander off and elope. Um, there's also the uh, Angel Sense, and that is kind of looks like a you know just like a band that you would wear on your on your wrist, and that also has that GPS tech, uh, GPS tracking technology in it, so you can sync that to your phone as well to know where your child is at all times might want to use this on all of your children. <laughs> um, and then building a physical barrier outside of the home. So I have some families that will put a fence that's going all the way around their home. The locks are on the outside of the fence so that if the child was to, you know, the alarms went off, but they still got out of the window or door, there was a physical barrier actually outside of the home as well. Um, and next I'll be getting into durable medical equipment. I first just want to give a disclaimer that the, um, the dur durable medical equipment that I'm going to go over um, is what we use most in our clinic in the state of T Tennessee at Vanderbilt. This is stuff that we um, are getting covered. And then I'm also going to be talking about insurance, what we're able to get covered, what we're not able to get covered, but this is specific to our clinic. Um, so it might be different in other states. 
Um, so when these least constraining methods and least costly um, methods are no longer working, sometimes we have to go into durable medical equipment. Um, they may be covered by insurance. It just depends on the state, the insurance plan, um, and things like that. Many insurance reviewers, they're going to want the documentation explaining what constraining um what other least constraining methods have been used, why they're not working and how they've been ruled out. Um, and that's kind of where we come along as a therapist to explain um, why it is medically necessary. Okay, and then the first bed that I'm gonna talk about is the Sleep Haven bed from Beds by George. Um, it is, and hopefully you saw it out in the exhibit hall, but it's fully padded in the interior so the child does not have contact with um, those wood posts. It, you can also get exterior padding as well, that there's a top window that's available for a camera. If you want to monitor your child throughout the night, it zips from the outside, not giving the child access to the zipper and the mesh is pretty breathable. The next one is the safety sleeper by Abrams nation. It also zips from the outside and has breathable mesh. What makes this one different is that it can fold down and it, it's actually an air mattress. So you deflate the air mattress, you can fold it down and it can be transported easily. This is really great for families that travel a lot. And sometimes, you know, we have kids that have multiple caregivers, maybe their you know, mom and dad aren't together anymore and they need their bed to go with them so they can always stay safe. This is um, I have gotten this one covered a few times using that as justification. Um, it is sometimes for our clinic hard to get it justify because the insurance will say, oh, it's an air mattress. It's not durable. I don't know that it's necessarily fair for them to say that, but they say that sometimes. Um, and then the cubby bed is also an excellent bed. It has a camera and a microphone. It has a circadian light, speaker and sensors. Uh, mesh and fabric doors. So it's breathable as well. Um, something I do really like about the cubby bed is that it has these safety sheets that um, go from the mattress to like the outer wall of the bed and it zips in so that there's no chance of the child getting up under the mattress. So it's very safe. Um, we probably have the most difficulty getting this covered in our clinic, unfortunately, because the insurance will often say it is a luxury item because of all these added features, but it's a great bed. And next I'm going to talk about um, medical car seats that have anti-escape features. The one we probably do the most in our clinic is the Roosevelt. The Roosevelt has to start at 35 pounds and it goes up to 115 pounds. Um, so it installs very much like a regular car seat, but what makes it special is that through Merit, we can order these anti-escape um, components that go on it. So the first one is a locking chest clip. Um, it has a little clip that will pop and it's locked. You can unlock it. Um, a strap that goes around the back of the neck that prevents the chest harness from being pushed down to get those arms out. Um, it also has a pretty great buckle cover and an additional, um, and that's what's, sorry, the locking chest clips on the top and then the buckle covers on the bottom. And there's an additional A-lock cover. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with car seats, but the way that you um, give slack to the chest harness and tighten it up, that little clip there, you can actually get a cover to go over that too. It is worth noting that Merit offers the locking chest clip and the buckle for purchase to put on to commercial car seats. Some families do go that route. Um, being a child passenger safety technician, I cannot formally recommend that because it's not been crash tested, um, but families have to decide you know, what they have to do to keep their child safe. And if their insurance isn't covering this, they kind of have to do what they have to do. Um, this is the Easy On Vest. It starts at uh, 31 pounds and can go up to 168. Um, it, it works very well. The restriction to this is that it only works with vehicles that have three rows of seating. So like large SUVs and minivans um, because the way that it's anti-escape is that it zips in the back and it has two rings that will clip onto floor mounts that come out through the bite of the seat. Um, so you have to have like a captain's chair for that to be compatible. So it doesn't work with, um, you know, any smaller cars or trucks or things like that. Um, but we do this one quite a bit too. And uh, next is the Churchill Booster with Harness by Merit. Um, this one is nice because that Roosevelt kids do outgrow it in the um, 
in their hip width and their shoulder width. So this would kind of be the next option. It starts at 44 pounds, goes up to 175. Um, it has the same locking chest clip and same buckle cover that was featured on the Roosevelt. The limitation of this one is that it is a booster. So you have to use the lap and shoulder belt as the restraint mechanism. So your anti-escape features are going to keep that kid in their seat. But if they were actually in a car accident, they have to have that seat belt over them as the restraint mechanism. And if it's a kid that's eloping, they're probably going to reach over and just <laughs> unclip it. We don't recommend buckle guards because they're not crash tested. Um, but again, sometimes families do have to, to use that if that's the only thing that's going to keep their child safe. Um, and lastly, mobility devices with anti-escape features. We love the Convade Easy Rider and the Legero Reach. Um, what we do is we order, or our lovely vendors order the components from Merit that have the locking chest clip and the buckle cover, and they retrofit it to these strollers. So it has the exact same anti-escape um, pieces. And then um, something else I wanted to also say about, especially about the, the strollers here and the beds is that, um, you know, we always, our goal is to have least restrictive, um, but for some kids, their equipment, they actually love it. So sometimes their safety beds are their safe places. Sometimes their strollers are their safe places, especially if they're really overwhelmed by their sensory stimuli that's in their environment. Um, so these might be things they decide, you know, later on if elopement's not an issue, sometimes they don't want to transition out of it because they, they enjoy using it. So it's not always something that they dislike. <laughs> um, let's see. And next, I'm going to hand it over to Chrissy, who's going to talk about therapeutic strategies. Okay. Um, so I'm going to speak to um, some therapeutic strategies. So this is a um, dual method approach. So um, all the equipment that Stephanie just talked about, we want all of that to be um, in place to keep the child safe. Um, but then along with occupational therapy, OT, or applied behavior analysis, depending on the reason the child is eloping, um, ABA. Um, so their goal is to use that equipment, and then the goal is to taper it off so that, um, you know, they're using more of these new safety skills participating in their daily lives um, without the need for the equipment as much. Okay. Um, so I'll get in, into the next few slides a little bit more into the details of these two disciplines. Um, but with OT, they're wanting to promote safe participation in daily activities. And with ABA, they're wanting to teach new skills, promoting generalization from, you know, um, less distracting environments into more over time, and then to specifically decrease challenging behaviors. So for OT, um, let's see. It, this is um, indicated when there's um, any kind of sensory processing concerns, um, limited body or safety awareness or concerns with impulsivity, and all of those concerns can lead to making following directions and participating in the community more difficult. So for example, if there's a concern with impulsivity, they can use relaxation, um, relaxation techniques such as um, controlled breathing, or they can work through impulsivity through purposeful play such as a game of red light and green light. For ABA strategies, um, this is indicated when there's um, specifically a challenging behavior that needs to be worked through. In the state of Tennessee, this is a covered service when there's a diagnosis of autism or intellectual disability. Um, they can, they want to teach skills to really promote high success. So for example, um, they want to start with um, waiting or staying with a caregiver for a really short period of time, even if it's just for three seconds, fall, immediately followed by a reward or high praise. Um, and then for another example, if they're teaching, um, like asking for a break, they'll, they can even do at first hand over hand, asking for a break card, handing it over, and then they get a break, like really just wanting this to be as successful as possible, somewhere familiar in their home with limited distractions first before bringing that um, into um, more generalized situations. Um, so tools they use, they want to be really concrete um, with expectations, very clear communication, using, using visuals as needed, and a lot of positive reinforcement. So for example, um, 
you know, they'll have like a timer and you know, we'll say, wait for 10 seconds and then you get this piece of candy. So um, I know that we've talked about this a little bit um, already, the why does this happen, but it's so important. Um, in ABA, they call that the antecedent, what's happening right before the child runs away. And that's what they really focus on um, to try to address the behavior. So for example, limited communication, um, definitely hoping that a um, speech language pathologist is involved here too. But if they have difficulty expressing their needs, that could be a reason they're running away. They're, you know, wanting to run to what they want to get to instead of being able to say, I want this. Um, they could be requesting, like trying to initiate a play of, of running away as a game of chase. Um, that they're trying to escape an overstimulating environment or a non-preferred task. Um, that they're trying to access preferred things, such as an environment or item of interest, or that they just want to explore, or that they're looking out that special topic or interest. And we need to know that to know how to address it. Um, so this is an example of um, what they call the ABCs, the antecedent, what's happening right before the behavior, the behavior itself, the elopement, and then the consequence. And I know that in our um, typical language, consequence usually has a negative connotation, but not always in this situation. It's just what's happening right after the behavior. What are they getting out of it? So in this example, the antecedent is a really high sensory environment. Um, they just started singing happy birthday um, and that's really overwhelming. So the child runs away because they need a break from that. And the consequence is that they get to somewhere that's less sensory stimulating. Um, so a way that this could go positively is that they start singing happy birthday. They have a safe way to ask their caregiver for a break. They come over, they hand a break card or whatever that cue is for that family. And then the consequence would be the same, that they would be in a less stimulating environment, but just getting there in a safer way. Um, so um, getting these services sometimes covered or long wait lists, all this can really be a concern. We do try to um, connect families with grants or different kind of funding options, state specific, um, but this is a really fantastic online free resource to everyone um, created through the Vanderbilt Triad Center. Um, they have a lot of online videos. Um, they can be as short as one to 10 minutes long. There are kind of more broad top topics and strategies all the way up to application videos that are an hour plus long um, as part of a series um, that are more specific action plans. Um, so there's two specific to elopement on here. One's 38 minutes long, it's called learning safe behaviors. And then there's another one that's about an hour and 15 minutes long called teaching safety skills. Um, and it would be a really good place for parents to start if they're having difficulty accessing um, the therapies like while they're waiting. So next I'll bring up Ken to discuss some ethical considerations. So good morning. I'm gonna speak a little bit about um, some of the ethical um, considerations we should be thinking about whenever we're considering equipment for our patients. Um, so once a behavior has been defined as a challenge to the patient or members of the care team, the next steps um, considered are ways to minimize that behavior. And often that's what leads us down the road to equipment. However, it's really important that we remember that equipment should really be used only as equipment, something that will be a benefit to and least restriction to the patient. A restraint, on the other hand, as documented by Krishna, is defined as the planned or unplanned actions of care staff that prevents a patient from being able to do what he or she wishes. So restraints, as you might know, are often used in the medical community um, that require a physician's order and intermittent monitoring by medical staff. That's something that we're hoping to avoid for our clients is something that is restraining them. According to an article written by Weber, it has been documented that patients diagnosed with ASD have a two to one odd of being restrained at some point in their life. Not only does this restrict the patient, but it could lead to seclusion and social isolation. As a clinician that is evaluating the needs of, for the client and their family, it's important that we remember the um, equipment that constitutes the least restrictive environment to that patient. Um, so as clinicians, we are governed by sets of principles and values that establish a framework in our selection of equipment. We must be mindful to not take away the autonomy of a person. Menon demonstrated this point well, stating that the use of mechanical restraint 
is guided by the principle of least restriction and should be commensurate to the level of challenging behavior um, that client is exhibiting. I think that's a really interesting statement as it's talking about keeping the client's best interests in mind as opposed to the interests of the family or the care team. So the American Occupational Therapy Association Code of Ethics Principle 1 describes beneficence, which requires taking action to benefit others, to prevent harm, promote good, and remove harm. This statement guides a clinician to select equipment that will not only be of benefit to the client, but also keeping them safe from harmful situations. The principle of non-maleficence also guides an occupational therapist to refrain from causing harm, injury, or doing wrong to the patient. The American Physical Therapy Association Code of Ethics Principle 7 states that physical therapists shall promote organizational behaviors and business practices that benefit patients and clients and society. Subgroup 7A further states physical therapists shall promote practice environments that support autonomous and accountable for professional judgments. Principle 1 states that PT shall respect the inherent dignity and rights of all individuals. The Rehabilitation, Engineering, and Assistive Technology Society of North America also highlights a standard of practice under duties to consumers and public. This principle states to provide assistive technology recommendations which maximize outcome and minimizes consumers' exposures to unreasonable risk. The National Registry of Rehabilitation Technology Supplier states that clinicians should provide competent, timely, high-quality equipment and services to meet the physiological and functional needs, as well as goals of the consumer. So all of these principles um, established by our professional organizations have a similar theme that arches across, that equipment must be least restrictive and of most benefit to the patient while maintaining the safety of that person. As stated by the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, it is easy for a clinician to misapply or misuse an intervention, even when we have an established clear framework. So it's important for a clinician in any evaluation to approach equipment selection, analyzing in many different ways. There is typically not always one right answer for every person or every behavior. The authors of this article created an ethical framework to help guide a clinician to the best answer for each patient or situation. It's important to look at the goals and determine who is setting these goals, who's benefiting. Does a family member benefit more than the patient is? What are the long-term effects of not having this intervention? When considering interventions for elopement, there are certain practices that people should avoid according to the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. For example, one should not just consider an intervention or a trait that is considered atypical for that age group. Just because a person has a different trait or behavior does not mean that they should have a different expectation from people their same age. If a client is unable to verbalize their feelings, one should not assume that the person doesn't have feelings about that intervention. A clinician, clinician needs to consider the patient's feelings towards the intervention and always keep that in mind when applying that. It is wrong to assume that a person is not capable of learning a skill without an intervention. This should be a guiding principle in our equipment selection. If a person is no longer needing equipment that he or she once was due to behaviors, this should not be used anymore. Along with this idea, equipment should never be used as a punishment. So a stroller with anti-elopement features or a car seat with anti-elopement features should be discarded and not used as a punishment um, or a timeout. In conclusion, there are many factors that a clinician should consider when completing an equipment evaluation for children that elope. Interventions should be least restrictive and always restrict, restrict the patient as minimally as possible to maintain that safe environment. When considering an equipment intervention, the ethical questions regarding that piece of equipment should be answered. These will guide the clinician into deciding if the intervention is a benefit to the patient. When an unsafe behavior is no longer exhibited, it should be discarded. The clinician should consider the thoughts and feelings of the client, even when they're not able to express them themselves. And we as clinicians have a duty to protect our clients from interventions that are unnecessary or used improperly. Interventions should never be used as a punishment. 
And now I'm going to hand it over to Sarah that's going to talk a little bit about more what we do at um, Monroe Carroll Junior Children's Hospital. Thank you, Ken. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Moran, and I'm excited to wrap up our presentation by telling you what we do in our clinic. So as I mentioned, we represent the pediatric seating and mobility team at Monroe Carroll Jr. Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt. We recognize that you are all here with different experiences. Your clinics may run differently, but we thought it might be kind of fun to tell you what we do and how we handle these evaluations for children uh, with a history of elopement. So we are part of a large regional medical center. We receive referrals from several surrounding states. So some of our patients may be riding in the car for several hours before they get to our appointment. Um, and so they could come in already stressed from that experience, um, especially if the child is eloping while in the vehicle. Our team is comprised of physical and occupational therapists with extensive experience evaluating the mobility needs of pediatric patients. All of us have completed the child passenger safety technician training. Most of us have attended the safe travel for all children course. Um, Dr. Brian is actually an instructor for that course. Um, a few of us are assistive technology professionals. So we work together often, um, and we're so lucky that we have such a knowledgeable team that we can bounce ideas off of and call in if we need help um, during an evaluation. When we referrals are received by our clinic, appointments are going to be scheduled with either a PT or an OT, um, and we also have the family's preferred vendor present. Depending on the amount of equipment that we're anticipating assessing them for, these evaluations last between one and two hours. Um, we work closely with reputable vendors who have proven to be experts in pediatric seating and mobility, and we make sure to have an ATP present for every evaluation. Um, at, I'm sure it's clear, we really value this team approach to decision-making, so we always include the patient and the caregiver in the decision-making process to ensure we're providing meaningful equipment and then also to help reduce the risk of equipment abandonment. Each patient is individually evaluated and equipment is customized to meet their needs. And again, we value input from everyone on the team. Our scheduler actually asks some screening um, questions when she's scheduling patients who are referred to us with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder or elopement because she wants to help let us know if they may need some additional support needs during their time in our clinic. So based on what the caregivers tell her, we are able to direct them to a private waiting room while waiting for their appointment. Um, our seating and mobility clinic takes place in a big room. There could be two evaluations going on. Um, it's not the most friendly environment for a child who may elope or may have additional sensory needs. So in those situations, we're able to use our sensory room, which is mats on the floor, crash pads. We've got hooks for swings. We can dim the lights. It's very quiet. Um, it also has a door that's very easily blocked to prevent elopement during the evaluation. And when patients are referred to us for a piece of equipment, we try to do a holistic evaluation to determine if they have any additional needs, not only what they were referred to, but anything else that may help them out, because we want to reduce the number of trips they have to take to our clinic, especially if the child is eloping from their car seat. We don't want the families to have to spend more time in those unsafe situations. Um, and we really value efficiency. So while we're going through our evaluation, we have created these awesome templates where we can write our letter of medical necessity while the ATP is going through their order form. That way we can get everyone in and out as quick as possible. And that also reduces our documentation burden after the appointment. If needed, we can complete our assessments through telehealth. We're very grateful for that option. Um, so if a child is really not tolerating our environment, they can go ahead and go to the car and we can finish from telehealth or we can schedule a follow-up at another date um, as long as we're licensed in the state that they live. Before ordering equipment, um, we are so fortunate that we have a huge demo inventory. So we're actually trying kids in the equipment every time before we order it. Um, so here you can see a picture of the family, the ATP, the therapist, and the patient all actively engaged in this evaluation process. And so here we're 
demonstrating the anti-escape features of this particular car seat. And because we're all CPSTs, we always go out to the car to evaluate their current car seat setup um, whenever possible. So oftentimes we're finding that their commercial car seat is either improperly installed or they're not harnessing the child correctly. Maybe the harness isn't in the right place, the straps are too loose, the chest clip isn't in the right place, or there's um, twists or folds in the harnessing as well. Um, and most of the time the commercial car seat isn't properly installed. And so we're able to coach families on how to make their child more safe while they're waiting for their adaptive car seat to come in. And then when it comes time for delivery of the adaptive car seat, we teach the family how to install it. We show them in the clinic. We also pull up the installation videos that the manufacturers have online. And then we go to the car and we're coaching family to install it. So we never install a car seat for a family. We make sure that they're hands-on and they're installing the car seat. That way, if they need to take it apart to clean it or move it to another vehicle, um, we have that confidence that they can safely do that. Um, we also had a student who created QR codes to provide families that they can scan the code and it takes them to the online manual uh, from the manufacturers and it also takes them directly to links to watch the installation videos. So that's a nice reminder if they haven't installed the car seat in a while. And when recommending equipment, um, I'm sure you caught on to this theme throughout our presentation, but we always wanna consider the risk versus the benefit of using that device. Our goal is to only have patients use the equipment for as long as they need to and taper it as their support needs change. So the ultimate goal is for the child to participate in a variety of environments with the least restrictive equipment or supports possible. Um, we have a lot of students that come through our clinic and um, an amazing student we have with us right now, her name is Sarah D Duckworth. She's an occupational therapy student from Belmont University. And she's creating a social story that we can share with caregivers in advance so that they can um, expose their children to it and help prepare them for the visit to our clinic. Um, it's going to have step-by-step -step photos and a dialogue of what their experience will be like when they come to see us. Um, she's also put together a box of fidget toys that we keep right in our seating and mobility clinic um, so that we can engage with, um, I'm sorry, we can entertain our patients so that caregivers can focus on the subjective portion of the evaluation because it is very stressful. Parents are trying to keep their child from eloping, but they're also trying to listen to what we're saying and take a look at the equipment. Um, whenever we have a student in our clinic, we rely heavily on them to engage with the patient so that the caregiver can interact with us and touch and feel and see the equipment. Um, and participate in the subjective portion of the evaluation. Um, so we've got a big dream. We want to get a child life specialist in our clinic so that they can engage with these patients during our evaluations and kind of take that stress off of the caregivers um, and help facilitate a more pleasurable experience all around for the caregiver and the patient as well. So at this time, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Brian for some closing remarks. Hi, so um, I just want to take a couple of minutes to go over our takeaways. So I think that um, we're living in a culture of either or where we're polarized and we're for something or we're against something. But I think like addressing elopement well, we have to be like both and like we have to consider many things. So not just do we use equipment, but what therapeutic strategies can we also use? What education can we provide to families? How can we best holistically address this? And so um, we have just a few recommendations on that. So one is honoring the child and caregiver perspectives. And that can be challenging to do. I think a lot of times we've historically hit the elopement from the caregiver perspectives. And that's important. Caregivers need to be taken care of because they need to be able to rest. They need to be able to function to care well for their child. But we also have to honor child perspectives as well. And I know it was stated a couple of times. And I'll say when I first started seating and mobility and I was like, oh, goodness, we're going to put all these kids who, who elope, who have autism in these strollers. They're going to hate it. It's going to be awful. I can't believe we're going to do this. Um, I, I think I can't highlight strongly enough how often this equipment is a safety, like support and a comfort zone for the kids. I had a little girl last week who's a very anxious 
um, child. She's verbal. She um, is autistic. And her stroller is her safe space when she's out in the community. And so she got out of her commercial stroller and she sat on the bench and let me take measurements. And as soon as I was done, she said, stroller, please harness, please. And so she got back in and she just really like wanted to be in that place where she knew I wasn't going to mess with her. She was in a safe, in a safe space. So for a lot of kids, this is a preferred way for them to engage, especially for those kids who are getting overwhelmed. Um, I also think about those kids who are literally like climbing the walls. They're standing on the rolling stools, jumping, picking up whatever, trying to get all over the place. And I would think those would, kids would hate being in a stroller, right? But for a lot of kids, that is what helps really calm them. So, um, so we want to make sure to honor those perspectives. Also, that's not true of every child, right? Not every child wants to sit in a stroller or have a harness. There are some kids who really want to walk. So using a wrist leash or something like that might be a safer way um, for them to do that. So we just want to talk about the caregiver perspective and the child perspective and try to find um, the best blend of strategies. We want to pr prioritize safety and prioritize participation. So um, if we are only coming at it from a safety perspective, we might fail to allow families or encourage families to participate. So um, choosing equipment that helps promote the participation, but also ensures that a child is, uh, is safe. We want to use a variety of strategies, both AT and non-AT. I think we've said that over and over. Um, use least restrictive interventions. Um, and then as we are advocating for uh, equipment for children, you need to document all of the strategies that have been tried and the results of those. And I think more and more often we're being asked that. So if we're recommending a safety bed, the insurance wants to know, well, tell me why you can't use a regular bed. Why can't you use a hospital bed with rails? Why can't you da, 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 da. And so the list of what they're wanting to know, why haven't you tried is getting longer. But I do think it is important for us to document that um, and the outcomes of it. Um, and then I think one area where we've really improved our practice as we've kind of explored this topic is just in providing education to families um, on elopement reduction strategies and on safe and judicious use of the equipment. I know it was said, don't ever use this equipment as punishment or time out or anything. We can't emphasize that en enough. And we want to make sure that caregivers really, truly understand that. Um, because the equipment is meant to be a support and not um, not a restriction. And because we know that families are not getting a lot of education on elopement, we want to, if you're the person in front of them and you're the healthcare provider, you want to provide them all that you can in terms of education. And so um, our capstone student is helping us develop some handouts that we can give um, with some of these these resources that we've shared with you that we can have that we can hand to a family so that when they leave our session they can go home and they can find a lot of education um, um, on their own. So um, as we wrap up, um, we've already talked about Sarah, our capstone student. Alicia Stainbrook is an ABA therapist as well who helped contribute to our content. Um, here is our contact information for anyone. You are welcome to email us um, if you have any questions. And then I do have references. Our handout is available um, on the app, so you can pull that up at any time. Um, but I think we have just a couple of minutes. Anybody have a question? I see something here. 